Let's open our Bibles to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, we want to begin here in verse 15. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which were your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As we mentioned last week, as we looked at a lesson on good choices, we recognize that there is a choice. God has made us as creatures that have free will. We can decide to love and honor and serve Him, or we can decide to resist Him and to do our own will. When you look into the Bible, you see, as we noticed last week, there are people who make good choices or who made good choices in their lives. There are others, of course, that we read about that have made bad choices. One of the ones that stands out to me is Goliath. When he went out to the field of battle, he looked at David and held him in contempt and thought he would surely defeat this little boy who's come out to him with a stick, you know, with shepherd's weapons, with a sling, and some stones that there was no contest of course it was no contest but it was David who slew Goliath and if we could talk to Goliath today we would recognize he regretted stepping out there and facing David because David of course took his life and we sometimes make bad decisions we sometimes look back in life and think I was absolutely wrong and I wish I could go back and fix it. I wish I could go back really and undo it. But there isn't really an undoing of things, if you will. We may have made the decision out of ignorance. We may have done it out of stubbornness and self-will. Whatever the reason is, those bad decisions are things that come back sometimes to haunt us and to plague us. That there are things we understand that we've done that God in His providence has blessed us to make some level of correction, some level of change regarding that decision. And that might be a simple apology. Well, I'm sorry that I said that. I'm sorry I was ugly. I'm sorry that I didn't think about you. That I didn't have more compassion or kindness. So... It may be a simple apology, if you will. And it could be, and for many of us here, it's involved repentance, that we've put away the sin in our lives, determined that we want to live faithfully for God. So we've repented. We've had a change of mind that has led to a change of action in our lives. In this lesson, we want to go on and notice several individuals in the Bible who made very bad decisions. And if we could talk to them today, I believe we would get the answer from them that they made the wrong choice, that they regret deciding what they decided and acting the way that they acted. And in studying these things, what we want to do is warn ourselves away from repeating their mistakes to cause us to be more sober-minded, more cautious, more careful in the decisions we make, in the actions we take in life, so that we don't have that guilt, that regret, so that we are not causing pain and heartache and sorrow to others, and so that we are right before God, instead of being condemned before Him. The first one we want to look at is Lot. In Genesis chapter 13, Genesis chapter 13, you recall here how Lot is introduced to us as being with Abraham. And it says in Genesis 13, verse 1, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. And it goes on to tell us about how Abraham was rich. Down in verse 5 it says, Lot also went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. So Abraham was a very wealthy man, but also Lot was a very wealthy man, had many possessions. 
In verse 6 it says, Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Now this was at a time, of course, when we might describe it as free range. They, there weren't the fences up to keep them out from certain grazing lands, but them trying to dwell in close proximity with each other was simply not working. The fields in that area, the places where their animals could graze and go out to pasture and get water and all of that, it just wasn't enough space because they had so many of these possessions. And because of this, because of that close proximity and the difficulties and the resources that were being seen there, verse 7 it says, And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And so... There's strife between them. Remember that Abram is the uncle, Lot is the nephew. That this is family that are dealing with each other. And their herdsmen, if you will, their employees, are disputing with each other. They're getting into arguments. Maybe some scuffles that are happening. So things are not going well at this point. Verses 8 and 9 it tells us, So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Abram being the uncle, being really the leader of this family, he had the right to tell Lot, you need to leave and go to the left, or you need to leave and go to the right. But he deferred. And he gave that choice to Lot. You, you choose where you want to go. Whichever way you go, I'll go the other way. Because we shouldn't have this strife. We shouldn't have the arguing, the fighting between our herdsmen. It's just causing problems. So you choose one way, I'll go the other way. And that will improve the situation. So verse 10. Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward, Zo toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. So Lot looked out, and he saw this well-watered plain. So that means it's fertile out there. There's plenty of grass for his animals. And of course, that means there's food for his animals, his animals would grow, his animals would multiply, and that means he would have more possessions. So he's looking at it from a material perspective. This is good for business, if you will. I can go down there and I'm going to be well fed and my flocks will be well fed and everything will be wonderful, materially speaking. But notice verse 12. It says, Abram dwelt in the land of, uh, land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So when Lot made this decision to go down to that well-watered plain, he went and he ended up settling his tents, pitching his tents, as it talks about here, down toward Sodom. But then the Spirit gives a footnote essentially on this. He gives commentary. He says, But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And what that's helping us to understand is that Lot went down there close to Sodom knowing that it was a wicked city full of wicked people. That was common knowledge in that area. Yet that's the way that he chose to go because he wanted that material blessing. In chapter 14, verse 12, as it's talking about how that there was this war between the kings in various places, they came down, they swept through the southern Jordan Valley. It says, They also took Lot, Abram's son, who dwelt in Sodom in his goods and departed. So chapter 13, he pitched his tent toward Sodom Chapter 14, he's living in Sodom. He's living in there among those who it said were exceedingly wicked before the Lord. Well, when you fast forward to Genesis chapter 19, you see the consequences that unfold because 
of Lot's decisions, of Lot's choices in life. In Genesis chapter 19, remember verse 12 there where it says, And the men said to Lot, Have, any, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the place, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So his home where he lived would be destroyed. Now, I don't know if any of you have been through something where your home has been destroyed, whether it's been uh, through a house fire, which where we lived before, just down the street, the people's home burned down. It was utterly devastating to them to lose all those things. Lot was not going to have time to, to pack up everything in his home and to, to move out here. They're saying, you need to get out, you need to get out right now. Remember, they even had to grab him and force him to leave. So his home, the actual dwelling place, the things that were there, they are going to be destroyed in this. He loses his home. We know in verse 14, So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. They didn't leave. Those sons-in-law. There's good evidence to point to the fact that Lot had two daughters married to these two men who didn't go as well. And then he had two of the daughters that made it out of the city with him, but we'll talk about them in a minute. But he lost family here. He lost his sons-in-laws, his two of his daughters here. And then we know down in verse 26, Genesis 19, 26, it says, But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. He lost his wife. Why did he lose his wife? Why did he lose his family? Why did he lose his possessions? because of that choice that he made. It gets even worse than that when you get down to verses 30 to 38. You remember that Lot's daughters hatched this scheme to commit incest with him. Why did all of this happen? Why did this unfold? Because Lot decided to go after material things. Physical blessings. That's what he was looking for. And it evidently did not bother him before he went down there that he would be going towards Sodom, getting closer to the wickedness. And then he ended up in the midst of the wickedness. When you get to 2 Peter chapter 2, you do read about where Lot being in the city of Sodom, that it troubled him, it bothered him. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, it says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who is oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So Lot was bothered by the sin that was going on around him. It vexed him day by day. But how did that affect his family? You see that it corrupted their hearts, their minds. It destroyed their commitment to the Lord. The sons-in-law, the daughters who stayed there. The wife who turned around longing evidently for Sodom and that life in Sodom. The two daughters who committed incest with him. You see how that those decisions that Lot made had an impact on his family. And if we could go and talk to Lot today and say, Lot, do you re regret going down and living near Sodom and then moving into Sodom? What do you think his answer would be? His answer would be, yeah, I regret that. Look at what happened. It utterly destroyed my life. But that happened again because of material desire. So our question is, have you put decisions on material things where you wanted the material advantage above moral purity? Is it the possessions? Is it the income? Is it the things that you are pursuing and you're not giving heed to the moral dangers? the influences, the impact that that has on your family. 
Is there a decision you have made that exposed your family to excessive ungodliness? I recognize we can't escape this world. We are going to live around people who commit sin. We live in a world where Satan is active and trying to tempt us and lure us into sin. So I recognize we cannot live in a bubble, but we can make choices and we can make decisions that help us to remain separate from those things to a degree where we are not confronted with excessive wickedness like Lot was. If we know there's a Sodom, we're foolish to go move and plant ourselves in the middle of that. Whether that's work, or whether that's actually the physical place we live, or the friends that we have, that's wrong for us to go put ourselves in the middle of that. We expose ourselves, we expose others to things that we don't need to be around. Are you ready to change these things? Maybe you've made some of those decisions, maybe it is. You've thought, well, this is income, this is an advantage, this helps us out. But you recognize now, or you can see, that's having a negative impact on my family. It's, it's taking us away from God. Were well, you ready to turn that around? You know, at some point you would have thought, Lot would have made the decision, we need to get out of here. This is bad. We need to leave. For whatever reason, I won't explain, I won't attempt to explain why Lot didn't leave and get out of there. But what we know for a fact is it devastated his family. Bad choice that Lot made. Let us not follow in his footsteps. Then there's Herod in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, we see this as someone who was caught up in a personal sin. You know, Lot, it says, was a righteous man. But he made bad decisions. And though he was able to maintain faith, it impacted his family. Here we have an example of a man who entered into sin. And he made a choice to execute the prophet of God. And it was the wrong choice. In Mark chapter 6, verse 17, it says, For Herod himself had sinned and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. So he arrested John and he puts him in prison because John came and rebuked him for his sin. In verse 18 it says, Because John had told Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. In other words, you're living in adultery. You have no right to her. You need to send her back to your brother is the idea. That's where she belongs, not with you. And he rebuked Herod. And by extension, he rebuked Herodias in this, exposing their sin, telling them they shouldn't be doing this. And so he arrested him and put him in prison. Now Mark chapter, or rather Matthew chapter 14 tells us that originally Herod wanted to kill John. He was so angry initially, he wanted to kill him, but he feared the people. So he stuck him over there in the prison. Well, his wife wasn't of the same attitude. She didn't fear the people like Herod did. Of course, Herod's sitting in a position of power, and he recognizes, you know what, I could be removed from power. I execute John, and, and, and maybe that's okay as far as the government is concerned. But if the people start raising a stink and they get angry, I could be driven out of office. I could be removed. I could even be exiled. So he doesn't want to do any of that. But his wife isn't looking at it like that. In Mark chapter 6, verse 19, Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he had heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So Herod softens. He has that flash of anger, throws him in prison. But his wife harbored that anger, that wrath. She wants John dead, and she doesn't let it go. So you drop down to verse 21, Mark 6, verse 21. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me I will give you up to half 
my kingdom. Now, we read about this and it talks about Herodias' daughter going in and dancing before Herod and the others. Let's be very clear, this is not a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old little girl going in there and playing princess in front of these men. This is a developed young woman who's inciting lust in the men. Now, that's what kind of mother she had, that she would let that happen, that she planned for this to happen. This opportune day, her and her mother conspired on this. She sends her daughter in there. She stirs up his lust when he's in this feast, probably intoxicated, and he says, do whatever you want. Just tell me, up to half my kingdom, which was a proverbial saying. He didn't literally mean up to half his kingdom, but basically saying, just tell me what you want. And so he made this lustful promise. Well, then the answer comes back in verse 24. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So I want his head. It's time. Execute him. Verse 26, it does tell us this. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. And so he immediately sent, verse 27 says, the executioner went and he beheaded John and brought his head on a platter, gave it to the girl, the girl gave it to her mother. You know, this is one of those occasions where we read somebody instantly regretted their choice. That decision that he made to say, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. Just tell me what you want, I'll give it to you. Well, I want John's head. Hmm. He didn't see that coming. But it's a decision he made, a choice he made, and he followed through with it because of the people who were around him. That was the wrong choice. So he's making one bad choice after another here. Now, if we could talk to him today, would he say, yes, I regret everything step along the way. I regret every action. Here he is as a king, as a man who's living in adultery that he's trying to defend himself living in sin. He's trying to get rid of that rebuke. He doesn't want to hear it. His wife doesn't want to hear it. She's putting pressure on him and does eventually win in her scheme. And you see how that one sin opened the door for another sin. You've got the adultery to start with, which opened that door for him to arrest John, which was sinful in and of itself, but just because John told him the truth. And then it opened that door for the lustful dancing, for the promise that he shouldn't have made, to going forward with executing John. One sin leading to another sin leading to another sin. One bad choice after another as he's trying to oppose the truth. Do you regret decisions that you made trying to remain in sin? Trying to defend yourself in sin? Maybe somebody has rebuked you for it and you get angry with them. You attack them. Maybe you've not arrested them. I doubt any of you have arrested someone for it. But if you could, would you do it? You're just trying to shut them up. Quit telling me about that. I don't want to hear it. Do you allow others to pressure you to stay in sin or to go further? Like Herod allowed his wife to do that. She kept the pressure up, cracked that scheme, took him further down the road. Do you allow others to do that? People at work, maybe your friends. Do you regret allowing that to happen? I would say if you live very long, you regret it. Do you speak against the truth? You oppose the one who's teaching that truth? You're just mad, you're angry because you want to stay in your sin. You don't want anybody to say anything about it. Well, when you're in that mindset, you're with that attitude, you will make one bad decision after another bad decision. Just like Herod did. Let's look at Felix now. In Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. In Acts 24, beginning in verse 22, 
It says, but when Felix heard these things, having a more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. This is Paul being before him. It says, so in verse 23, he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide or visit, uh, provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Now, a couple of things. First of all, Felix and Drusilla, they're living in adultery. And when it says that Paul is reasoning with him about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, he's saying, here's what God preaches. You're in violation of it. You don't have self-control. You need to have self-control. And you're going to be judged by God. That's the upshot of it. Because you see that when he preached to him about righteousness, self-control, the judgment to come, says Felix was afraid. Paul got to him. He exposed his sin. But then Felix's answer is, you know, when I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. Not, right now is not convenient. Whatever his reasoning, his rationale in, in his own mind was, he says, it's just not convenient. I, I hear what you say, and really what he's doing is he's acknowledging there's some truth here. I, I see what you're talking about, but it's just not convenient right now. He's not telling him, I don't believe you. He's just saying it's not convenient right now. Well, you read verses 26 and 27 where it says, Meanwhile, they also hoped that money would be given him by Paul that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, Felix and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Two years! He didn't find a convenient time. And the Bible leaves us right there with Felix, giving us the understanding Felix never found a convenient time. He had that opportunity right there as Paul was before him, preaching to him about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. He says, it's just not convenient. I get it. It's not convenient. Well, jump forward with me then to Acts chapter 26. Acts 26 where this Festus and Agrippa are involved and Agrippa here has been invited to come by Festus to hear Paul, to hear Paul's defense, to hear this case, to try to give Festus some idea of what he's supposed to write as he's sending Paul off to Rome. But in Acts chapter 26 beginning in verse 24, and Festus said, King Agrippa, all the men who are here present with us you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write up to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I brought him out before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write, for it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. I have no idea what to do with Paul. Can you please tell me what to do with him? In chapter 26 then, chapter, chapter, uh, Acts 26, let's jump down. I, I was reading out of 25 there. But Acts 26, verse 24. Now as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of the things escapes his attention. For since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. What's this telling us? As Paul was giving his defense, as he was explaining about the Christ, 
about Jesus being the Lord, about his encounter with him on the road to Damascus and subsequent events that he could see Agrippa knew. And Agrippa, he asked, do you believe the prophets? And he really doesn't give him time to answer because he says, I know that you believe. I know you believe it. He was familiar with the prophecies of the Jews and about the coming of the Christ. And that's why Agrippa responds, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. But you keep reading on and he doesn't. He doesn't become a Christian. So as we think about both Felix and Agrippa, do you think they regret their decisions? Do you think Felix regrets not taking advantage of that convenient time? And Agrippa, not becoming a Christian, when he was almost persuaded, he was right there. But he wouldn't go further. You wouldn't take that last step, if you will. Well, are you waiting for a more convenient time? Are you living in sin and you know you're living in sin? You know what righteousness is. You know what the Word of God says. But you're not exercising self-control. You realize there's a judgment to come. Right now is a convenient time. Are you going to let that slip by? Do you lack the conviction do you lack the fortitude and the determination that you're going to put sin out of your life and live for the Lord there is no more convenient time than the time that is right now are you almost persuaded that you believe you understand it you get it you're not like Festus who cried out to Paul you're crazy you're like Agrippa I see it I'm almost there. I'm about there. You know, to be almost persuaded is to not be persuaded. To be almost persuaded is to not be saved. To be almost persuaded is to go to hell. That's what that is. Don't be almost persuaded. Be, be altogether persuaded to do the will of the Lord. If you will, open up to the imitation song number 814. 814. Stephen, let's change that to 810. That? 810. Almost persuaded. Perfect. 810. Almost persuaded. You know, just as Joshua long ago laid it out to the people, a very simple but very stark contrast. You can serve the gods who are on the other side of the river. You can be idolatrous. You can be in sin and unrighteousness. Or you can serve the Lord. And Joshua gave his answer. Joshua told the people about his choice. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need fathers. We need husbands. We need mothers. We need people who are young and people who are older to have that same kind of conviction. As for me and my family, if I have anything to do with it, we are going to serve the Lord. You need to make the right choice, the right decision. God has blessed you by giving you time to hear His truth and giving you now this opportunity to make a good choice in your life. So take an honest look at your life. Are you living faithfully for the Lord? Are you committed to Him? Or are you living in sin? You're drawing closer and closer to sin. You're, you're on your way to being in the midst of Sodom. Are you resisting? Well, now, not now. When, when I get older, you know, there's another time when I get these things fixed in my life. You know, it'll be more convenient. It won't be more convenient. The devil won't let it get more convenient. Now is a convenient time. Now is the right time. So make your decision. Forsake sin, turn to the Lord. If you're a child of God, repent and confess. If you're not a child of God, then come forward confessing that Jesus is the Christ. Turn you away from your sin and we will immerse you that your sins may be forgiven. If you need to make that choice now, please do so. Come forward while we stand in sin.